Hello, welcome to another week of lecture. Uh, this lecture we're going over the, the Industrial Revolution. And it's going to cover about 160 years or so, 1754 to 1914. And let's look at early industrialization. Uh, industrialization begins in Western Europe really due to two advantages. Two advantages. Uh, one, there's an independent middle class. And number two is because of the scientific revolution. And it turns out that Britain, of all places, is going to be the center point of both of these things in many ways. Uh, Britain has some real advantages here. They have coal deposits and iron deposits. They have overseas colonies to get raw materials from and to sell things to. And these overseas colonies really create this global trade network. So Britain has the money, Britain has the capital, Britain has supportive laws for economic development, Britain has a strong bank. Uh, Britain also has a growing population and the growing population, uh, they need both food and goods. And one of the things they need the most of is textiles. So this is going to lead to the development and creation of something known as the cottage system. Uh, basically, you would give your work to somebody else and they would finish the work in their cottage and then you would buy it back. There are going to be some new inventions that are developed in the textile industry between 1700 and 1800 that are going to speed up the process of industrialization. One thing is called the flying shuttle in 1733. It's a mechanism that allows wider fabrics to be woven. In 1764, you get the spinning jenny, and that allowed one machine operator to make and spin eight uh, threads of, of spool threads at one time. 1769, you get the water frame, which spun thread using water power. And in 1779, the spinning mule is going to put the spinning jenny and the water frame together. And before you know it, you can do hundreds of spools of thread all at once. Finally, 1787, you get the power loom, which is going to be a steam powered loom instead of a person or water powered loom that will turn thread into finished cloth. So before 1733, all cloth was made at home by yourself. And by 1787, we have large factories making cloth in a mass produced fashion. So industrialization, it's gonna spread. It starts in Britain. It goes across the English Channel to Belgium, and then it gets France. Germany, eventually Russia, the United States will begin to see the first touches of industrialization 1793 with Samuel Slater. Now Samuel Slater, he is going to create and reproduce a British textile mill in the United States. And by 1825, you're going to see mechanical looms and power looms all throughout New England. The best example I can think of when it comes to what an American mill looked like is the Lowell, Massachusetts mills, the Waltham Lowell mills that opened in 1813. Uh, and in US history, I dedicate part of a lecture to this. Um, hundreds of young women from surrounding areas would come and they would work in these mills just outside Boston. Um, after the Civil War is really when you see an explosion of industry in the United States. And by 1870, the United States is going to produce more spindles of thread than Great Britain did. And by 1914, the United States has the world's largest industrial economy. Now, there is something that Britain and Belgium and Germany and the United States have in common. 
One of those things is a large amount of available coal, a growing population wanting consumer goods, a large number of available workers, and protective tariffs that allowed industry to grow. When we get to later industrialization, um, the second industrial revolution, as we call it now, begins in the 1816, 1860s and 1870s. Uh, industry is going to start switching from using iron to using steel, and that can really be seen in Germany once Germany gets started in 1871. Germany becomes the leading industrial power of Europe by 1914. It's got the most modern factories, the best equipment available. You also see Russia and Japan becoming industrialized during this time period, but that's not really by choice. They're dragged along kicking and screaming. This second industrial revolution is where we start to see synthetic dyes. Uh, we get the synthesizing of ammonia. And that's important because the synthesizing of ammonia leads to modern fertilizers, it leads to dynamite, it leads to improved foods. We get cheaper paper, uh, we get artificial silk. Charles Goodyear invents vulcanized rubber that allows rubber to have increased elasticity, increased strength, and increased water resistance. So it's gonna be stronger, it's gonna be more flexible, it's gonna be more useful. Synthetic soaps lead to better personal hygiene. Synthetic plastics lead to better food preservation. And we have electricity being pioneered by both Nikolai Tesla and Thomas Edison. Uh, their inventions are going to allow for the transmission of power and the creation of electricity generating power plants. And that's going to allow for the replacement of kerosene oil lamps. Uh, oil and kerosene, they're going to find new uses. They're going to be used with the invention of the internal combustion engine. So oil and kerosene, even though they're not going to be used in lighting, they are still going to become and be used every day. Um, many engines are eventually going to run on gasoline, which is actually a byproduct of refining oil into kerosene. There are going to be some new communication inventions. Uh, Telegraph, which we've mentioned before, and, and Morse code are going to allow for nearly real-time communication. Uh, transatlantic cables are going to be strong between America and Europe. And America and Euro Europe, they can communicate in less than five minutes instead of the two to three weeks it used to take with steam engine and sail. There's also something called the wireless telegraph invented by Heinrich Hertz. And that allowed for wireless communication, aka radio, between ships while out at sea. And eventually that led to transatlantic radio messaging, which is even quicker than what the telegraph was. You also have to look at weaponry. Thanks to advances in chemistry, thanks to advances in metallurgy and machinery, uh, weapons become increasingly deadly. And this leads to things like uh, breech-loading weapons, repeating rifles, clip-fed weapons. Uh, artillery is going to do the same thing, just on a much larger scale. It's going to get more and more complicated, more and more deadly. And then you have the Gatling gun, uh, which is going to be replaced by the fully automated Maxim machine gun. And the first true machine gun is invented in 1884, where it's no longer hand powered by a crank. It is going to be a true repeating machine gun. We have a lot of big businesses that are going to be developed out of this second industrialization period. Uh, large businesses form such as Standard Oil, US Steel, the uh, Krupp Steelworks in Germany. And there are going to be new management styles that are going to allow for production around the clock. Uh, ownership is going to be separated from workers. There's going to be the development of this middle management uh, group, if you will. Now, there are some social impacts that come from this. One of them, uh, there's this separation of... of um, the upper class and the middle class and the working class. The upper class or the old money, uh, they're going to be factory owners, bankers, merchants, uh, people who made money or married money. 
uh, they're going to be about 5% of the population around the world, and they own like 40% of the wealth. You got the middle class, which is going to be about 15% of the population. This middle class are typically educated. They live in fairly nice homes. Uh, they buy luxury goods. And within that middle class, there is an upper middle class and a lower middle class. The upper middle class is going to be made up of professionals, government officials, merchants. The lower class is going to be made up of small business owners, shop owners, factory workers. Uh, the working class, those are going to be the wage workers, and those are going to be the factory workers as well. Some of the working class are considered skilled, others are unskilled. There's repetitive work, dirty work, dangerous work, deplorable conditions, and a lot of these factory workers are working in factory towns. They're towns that are either built by the factory owner or support that factory. Uh, these working classes, uh, they're going to live in streets that are crowded, poorly built buildings, dirty environment surrounded by pollution, acid rain, and very limited access to clean water and lots of disease. So the upper class is the wealthy elite, the middle class, the bourgeoisie, the working class becomes known as the proletariat. So there are three different names for these three different groups of people. Something else that's going on is a lot of population growth. Uh, Britain is going to grow by 40 million people between 1850 and 1914. Over 50% of that population is going to live in cities. Germany goes from uh, 40 million to 60 million people from its foundation in 1871 up to 1914. And a lot of this is to do with migration, immigration, improved food quality, improved sanitation, and medicine, modern medicine starts to lower the mortality rates. Here in the United States, this is a huge period of immigration. 35 million people move into the United States from around the globe. There are some critics to this industrialization. There are socialists such as Henri de Saint-Simon, uh, socialists like Louis Blanc and Charles Fourier. They believe very much that private property should be distributed equally, that workers should push for equal rights, and that those who are doing the worst jobs should get paid the first or the most. Robert Owen is going to encourage the foundation of trade unions in Great Britain, and he's going to encourage these trade unions to strike, even though technically the strike is illegal in Great Britain. And then finally, Karl Marx, who is the most famous of these critics, he and his co-author Friedrich Engels are going to create the theory of scientific socialism and scientific socialism is going to state that all of history has involved a class struggle. This class, class struggle involves materialism, and the only way to solve the class struggle between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, the middle class and the working class, is through violent revolution. And once the violent revolution has happened, then all the workers can share in the fruits of their labor equally. Marx and Engels, together, they write the Communist Revolution in 1848, and it becomes very popular with the working class throughout the world. And many see the Communist Manifesto as a blueprint, a how-to manual on how to overthrow the bourgeoisie. There are some labor reforms, specifically in Britain. They're the first to really get on board with this. Um, in 1833, the Factory Act will establish the working day for children. Before this time, children as young as five were working in factories. And the minimum age of nine is set for the Factory Act. So if you're under the age of nine, you cannot work. If you're between the ages of nine and 13, you could work eight hours a day. And if you're between 13 and 18, then you can work 12 hours a day. 
1848, the 10 Hours Act will limit women and children to 58 hours of work per week. And the Mines Act of 1842 is going to prohibit women and girls from working underground. There's also going to be better pay. In Britain, wages increased on average by about 50% between 1850 and 1900. Now, it doesn't mean they're making a lot of money, but they're making a little bit more. There's also a women's suffrage movement happening in both Europe and the United States. Uh, women in Great Britain and women in the United States, they're demanding the right to vote. And this women's suffrage movement will eventually spread to France and Germany as well. So you have the National Society for Women's Suffrage happening. You've got the Women's Social and Political Union happening. The French League of Women's Rights. The Union of German Workers Organizations. And the National Women's Party along with the National Women's Suffrage Association in the United States. Those are all mouthfuls. I doubt I'll test you on those. So don't worry too much about the individual groups, but some of the people who you may have heard of who are leading this are Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Alice Paul, Susan B. Anthony. There's improvement in sanitation and there are improvements in electricity. Um, Britain and mainland Europe for the first time start offering water service and sewer systems. Uh, Thomas Edison is going to perfect the light bulb, which brings light to homes and gets rid of those gas lighting indoors and those candles indoors. And believe it or not, there are fewer working hours. You're still working hard. You're still not working for high pay, but you do have some leisure time for cricket, soccer, rugby, baseball, whatever it might be. The new sciences is going to come out of the Industrial Revolution as well. Like atomic theory is discovered by Hendrik Lorentz uh, after the discovery of electrons. Uh, William Röntgen uh, discovers x-rays. And uh, Antoine Bacquerel and Marie Curie uh, are going to discover radioactivity. And all of that put together makes up atomic theory. And then you go down the rabbit hole of you know atomic bombs and everything else. Quantum theory comes from the discoveries of Max Planck, where he suggests that matter and energy are interchangeable. Basically, light is a form of energy. And then you got Ernest Rutherford, who discovers that radioactive atoms are going to release energy as they disintegrate. In other words, you can see with the right lighting and the right uh, observations that radioactive atoms give off a form of light. Albert Einstein, <clears throat> he's going to argue that space and time were relative to each other and that matter and energy are linked. And this is known as today's theory of rel relativity. You know the theory of relativity better as E equals MC squared. And Charles Darwin proposes the theory of evolution and the idea of natural selection. So there's a lot of scientific advances that are occurring during and as part of the Industrial Revolution. When it comes to psychology, philosophy, and religion, uh, Sigmund Freud, he draws connections between dreams and the human subconsciousness. He creates the idea of the id, the ego, and the superego, all parts of your subconsciousness that are fighting each other. And Friedrich Nitzsche, um, he's going to argue that rational thought leads to the intellectual truth. Um, people who had the willpower to follow the theory were seen as supermen, and those supermen would lead others to the truth as well. Uh, Nitzsche also very famously argues that God is dead and that Christians were a slave to the idea of morality. Uh, Nitzsche ends up in a... Um, a um, insane asylum before his death. Oh, we got to talk about the arts too. Uh, we've got a form of art known as cubism. If you have seen Pablo Picasso's work, those are great forms of cubism. Uh, basically, geometric shapes give contrasting perspectives. 
And the goal of cubist artists was to try and show multiple viewpoints of one object all at once. Now you also have Impressionism, uh, Claude Monet. <clears throat> He's going to use short brush strokes. He's going to rely on the reflection of light. <clears throat> he and others like him are going to keep colors separate. So if you ever look at a Monet, there are going to be uh, white patches in between all of the different colors. <clears throat> and in Impressionism, they're trying to capture the moment as it is. They want to leave the impression of that moment upon the viewer. Literature, uh, they're going to mock industry. They're going to try and emphasize the beautiful parts of life. You've got people such as... Um, there are people writing things like The Tale of Two Cities, Oliver Twist, you get Charles Dickens. And then uh, music. I have to mention music as well. Um, there are a couple of different things happening in music at this time. Uh, one idea is something called the leitmotif. Uh, Richard Wagner did this very often. And what would happen is whenever Richard Wagner wanted a character or an image to be represented in his music, he would repeat certain melodies and certain melodic phrases so that the listener knew that that portion of the music, that portion of the play, that portion of the opera, whatever it might be, referred to that particular character. You get 12-tone music by people like Arnold Schoenberg. And the idea of 12-tone or atonal music is to reduce music to a mathematical equation. And a mathematical equation is written using all the different notes in a particular scale. And this becomes known as a tone row. And all of the sounds or all of the notes from that tone row have to be used in some way, shape, or form before you can repeat a single note. And then last but not least, uh, Claude, de, <coughs> Claude de Bussy, or de Busset, if you say it in French, is using something called chord planing. Um, as seen in this picture, even if you can't read music, that's perfectly fine, you can notice that the top line and the bottom line are mirror images of each other. Where the top line goes up, the bottom line goes up as well. In chord planing, the chords are going to rise and fall together at the same intervals to make the sound feel full. And chord planing and parallel harmonies is going to be similar to Impressionism in visual art. It's meant to make a scene or make an image memorable in the listener's mind. In the PowerPoint that is on Blackboard. I do have a short video. It's uh, part of a work by Richard Wagner. It is one of my favorite classical pieces of all time. And if you want to take a few minutes to listen to this, um, I do encourage you to do that. It's a great example of the leitmotif. And if as you listen to it, you'll notice that there are certain musical passages that are repeated and each of those repeated musical passages references when the particular character would have been on stage in his opera. All right, short video, less than 25 minutes. Uh, it's kind of quick. I encourage you to read it a time or two or listen to it a time or two just to make sure you have everything. Also, remember for this week you do have your third reflection paper, so make sure that gets turned in.